Well, we come to this passage in Genesis, and I just uh, want to uh, emphasize again that we are reading here in our Genesis texts the very foundation, the, f- the foundation upon which the rest of the Scriptures, uh, the inspired Word of God, is built. And we all know that if you don't understand the foundation, the, uh, the, what's built on it is not going to be very sturdy. In other words, part of the problem that we experience in our day particularly, but it's not just in our day, it started very early after the uh, destruction of the temple and then as there was a, a separation between the believers in Yeshua and the, uh, the traditional synagogue, you begin to see less and less, now not right away, but less and less, you begin to see less and less emphasis put upon the Tanakh and far more emphasis put upon the apostolic scriptures. To the point where there came a time, and this was much later, I would say even during the time of the Reformation uh, in the 1500s and 1600s, there was plenty of emphasis put upon the whole Bible. It's, it's, uh, again, uh, interesting to me. I'm reading a book that gives uh, short biographies of maybe, I don't know how many, probably at least 50 to 75 Puritans. It just gives a short, uh, you know, picture of their life. It's amazing to me how many, and it's, it's all of the, the Puritans that became teachers and became writers, and, you know, it's not, uh, not Puritans in terms of the whole community, but just those that were the teachers, and so forth. It's amazing to me how many of them entered college when they were 12 years old in Cambridge. They got there, you know, got there, and it, when they came to America from the Netherlands, Many of the men, and probably a good deal of the women too, I don't know, but many of the men had studied Hebrew and Greek. They, of course, were could read Latin fluently because everyone at that day learned Latin, and besides their English, and they were studying the Bible. When you read some of their writings, they're constantly talking about what the Greek says, what the Hebrew says, and so forth. Unfortunately, and I'm not putting any school down, uh, you know, that's not my place, but unfortunately, more and more seminaries today, even evangelical seminaries, you can graduate from seminary without having taken Greek or Hebrew. When I was interviewed, uh, when I taught at uh, school, a school here, um, uh, I was interviewed by the academic dean. No, it actually was by the, by the president. And he asked me questions, and I got to ask him. Uh, I said, would it be okay if I ask you a question? He said, absolutely. I said, what is the goal of this, what was called school of ministry. What, what is the purpose? What do you see as one, of, if I'm one of the teachers, how will I know if I'm doing my job the way that it should be done? And he said, the, our goal is to graduate students who can, who can um, keep the attention of the people that they're talking to. Uh, I didn't, I said, well, okay. Um, and, but at any rate, what is happening in the Christian church today, and I'm not putting the Christian church down, please, I'm not bashing the Christian church, I'm just saying this is part of what the, is happening in our day, is that Christian churches are emphasizing less and less what they call the Old Testament, and more and more what they call the New Testament. As a result, If all you care about in your house is whether the windows are sealed, if all you care about is whether the the, the siding gets painted, and you never examine the foundation, when the foundation starts cracking, you know what? It's too late. Things start sagging. Things start going to derelict. And now you have to really basically do a whole lot of demolition to try to get down to where the foundation could have been repaired at some point perhaps without it having to be entirely redone or at least corners of it or whatever. I just use that as an illustration to say what we're studying right here in the book of Genesis is foundational to the whole story, the whole scope of scripture. And we know this to be the case because the apostles regularly refer to our texts as being the very proof that what they're teaching is correct. Now, in our portion, we have uh, 
Some of you parents will maybe get some questions when you get home, and uh, I hope you have good answers. Um, There may be some young children who want to know what we were talking about today and what it means and so forth and so on. And you hope that they're old enough to hear what you have to tell them. Um, if the, uh, you know, our perspective, my wife and I, was that uh, when our children ask us the questions, we felt they were old enough to hear the answers. So we waited for some questions to be asked. What is circumcision anyway? God is my witness. First class one of the first classes I had at Cedarville University was Old Testament Introduction, Dr. Riggs. And there was a girl in class who raised her hand and asked the question, what exactly is circumcision? Um, he took a deep breath and said, let me talk with you after class. Uh, uh, I, it's presumed that we know what it is, but would you also say that circumcision, it's just kind of strange, isn't it? If it's, now, if, if you look carefully again at the passages that we read, look at verse 10 of 17. In verse 10 of chapter 17, we read, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and uh, you and your descendants after you. This is my covenant. In other words, my whole covenant with Abraham is summed up in this. What is it? Every male among you shall be circumcised. That's the covenant? Is it supposed to be the sign? It never says it's the sign of the covenant. It says it is the covenant. That's kind of strange, isn't it? Especially since it's a sign that ought to be very private. It's not like it's something you, you know, like a special earring that you wear or some mark on your, on your hand or something that everybody would say, what is that? And you say, oh, let me tell you about the covenant. In fact, in fact, the, the rabbis, you know, they, they group the commandments into different groups. One of those groups is the chukim. And the chukim are the commandments which they say, we don't really know why we're doing this, but we do it because God told us to. And this is one of them. Well, I would like to suggest that uh, there is a good reason why God gave it as the covenant. So I say here, Taken by itself, the ritual of circumcision seems very strange as a religious symbol or sign. It has been mocked by unbelievers, misunderstood by the Christian church, and considered barbaric and antiquated by modern society. We haven't gone for years um, to the uh, Puyallup Fair. And... um, um, (laughs) But we went one year, and there was a booth at the Puyallup Fair that was asking for signatures to... Uh, uh, make circumcision illegal. They said it, it was barbaric. It was something that should not be in modern society. The basic trend in our own times by many health professionals is to discourage what has been a common practice in America and Europe, that is, circumcising all male children at infancy. And, you know, if you, if you go back years ago, almost every male child that was born was circumcised. Yeah. There is good evidence, however, that circumcision affords a number of health benefits. In fact, I was going to bring an article, and I I neglected to put it in my my bag, but um, I have several articles, but I have one particularly from a medical journal that that goes into this to a certain extent. Um, As you may or may not know, uh, they did surveys among uh, populations that uh, were known to have circumcised their, their male children, and the, n- the number of cases of cervical cancer amongst the women is much, much, much lower. There are other issues, too, which I won't go into of that medically. But that's not why God gave it. God gave it as a sign of a covenant. Why, we might ask, would God have chosen this sign for the covenant he had made with Avram? How does circumcision fulfill the role of a sign of the covenant, meaning it represents a core or crucial aspect of the covenant? The obvious answer, at least in my opinion, comes from the narrative structure of our text. Now let me explain that just briefly. And I'm not going to spend all day doing this, so don't worry, we'll eat lunch. Okay. Um, I believe that not only the words and the phrases and so forth 
were that the that the writers were born along in choosing these so, so that um, they are what God intended. Okay, don't get me wrong. God didn't tell Moses take a memo, and Moses went and got you know whatever and started writing down what you, no. He wrote as as he would have written, but he was guided. He was guarded. He was carried along. Peter tells us by the Ruach Hakodesh by the Holy Spirit. Now I think also the way that the that the scriptures are put together. Are imp that's important as well. So I, I think it's absolutely wrong in our modern times where these so-called scholars have torn apart the Bible and patched it back together the way they think it should be. Um, if you're not familiar with this, you probably will hear it at some point. There are some scholars, that, some of the German scholars in the past decades particularly, um, say that there were actually four or five or six or seven what they call redactors that put together the, the first five books of the Bible. And they say it's all tangled up. And by the way, they have Bibles that they've actually published that have the, verses, the sections colored by five or six or seven different colors so you know which author wrote it. And sometimes it's just one line inside of a whole... I mean, how they discovered this is, is beyond time for us to explain here. But no, uh, we have very good evidence that what we have in the Bible today is the manner in which it was written and put in order the way it is written. I think the order in which things are written is very important. So let's stop and think about this for a minute. Okay? Chapter 12. Let's go back five chapters. Chapter 12. God appears to Abraham and tells him to leave. Well, if you go back one chapter to uh, 11. But tells him to leave Ur of Chaldees and to go to the land that he would show him. Right? Did Abraham obey? Then God made a covenant with him. Right? He said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Actually, I will curse the one who curses you. Um, I will multiply you. I'll make your name great. Right? Um, so forth. And then ultimately, in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Not yet. Not until 17. <laughs> yeah, 12. Okay. Then what happens in 13? Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, what, the, the famine in the land, right? And so what does Abram do? He's thinking, well, isn't this wonderful? God said to give me this land. Nice. That's like buying a lemon car, right? Somebody says, hey, I'll give you my car. And it stalls on you the first time. You can't get it started. And you leave it next beside the road and whatever. Say, thanks a lot for that. So Abram's saying, what kind of land is it that can't even sustain us? So where does he go? Egypt. And when he's down in Egypt, he tells Sarah, Sarai to say, you're my sister. And of course, she's taken away. And... Uh, God gives a dream to Pharaoh, right? Are you with me? And they come back, okay? So now we're, we're in chapter uh, 13, 14, and comes back, and, and here's this Malkitzedek, this, you know, and, you know, he gives um, a tithe of all of the spoils, right, to Abraham, and so forth and so on. Abraham continues, but they're so prosperous now that, I mean, did I say wrong? Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek. And, uh, but at any rate, they have so much wealth that they, do, they can't stay together. Right? So Lot takes the most choice spot and Abraham gets what's left over. Abraham gets what's left over. Now, what, what, the next chapter, 15. He says, look, he, God appears to him and says, walk before me and be perfect. Be complete. And he said, well, how, can that, how is that possible? I don't have any offspring. Right? Let Eliezer, my trusted servant, you know, be the one who takes the covenant next. He said, no. <laughs> so he took him outside and he said, look at the stars. And where's that? we have that most famous verse then in verse 6 of chapter 15. And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Right? Okay, what happens in 16? Has he got the son yet? No. So he tries to do it himself. He said, God isn't helping me. I'll take it up myself. And Sarai, he, she says, here's my hand, maiden. Maybe she can give you a child. As I mentioned before, one verse. It just happened. Boom, 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 boom. He took... Hagar, he went into her, she conceived and gave forth a son. All within one sentence. Boom, just happens. 
Well, what about this promise that God would give him all of these, you know. So now we're in chapter 17. And he says, please, let Ishmael live before you. Let him be the one. Now, Paul tells us Ishmael is the son of the bond woman. And that he's the son of the flesh. God says, no. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the sign of a covenant, of the covenant that I made with you. Do you see where I'm going? Abraham, Avram. I'm going to change your name to Abraham. By the way, what does that mean exactly? Mahon, Mahon is the word for a multitude. And since his name ended with an M or a Mem, Avram, they just put Hon on the end. So it's Avrahom, Avrahon. Okay? So it means a father of a multitude or multitudes. That's at least one explanation. It probably is the better explanation because when you read the Hebrew, it's, it seems clear that there's a nice play on that. By the way, that is our connection to the Haftarah. You wouldn't have seen it if you weren't reading the Hebrew because we have that same, uh, that same word for multitude used in a different way. Um, it, it probably ties in that way. All right. So what does, he says, Abraham, you believed when I showed you the stars that I, God, would give you the offspring. That it would be God's work, not your work, God's work. But you went ahead and went ahead and did it your own way. Now, you're 99 years old, and we know if we keep reading, Sarah is no longer and I'll say it this way, as the old King James Version did, so that you parents can describe this to your, parents, your children when you want to. Um, she was no longer with the way of women. Right? Which means what? It was impossible for her to get pregnant. What do you think if Abraham followed his normal course of events as he did before, what do you think he would do? Find somebody else. So where does God place the sign? He places the sign on the organ of procreation with this, you have to discard the flesh. You cannot keep the flesh. In other words, you can't do it yourself. It will never work on your own strength by your own flesh. Which means what? It means that the son that is born is going to be a miracle son more than you can imagine. Now, every birth is a, is a miracle. I'm not dis discounting that whatsoever. But this is the way I write it on page 3. We can now understand why circumcision was chosen as the sign of the covenant, that which points to the covenant's most significant reality. It signaled the coming of the promised one by miraculous birth. In other words, the circumcision was, first of all, a sign of the son that... Sarah was going to give birth to Itzach, but ultimately it is a sign of Yeshua because that Isaac is a foreshadow of Messiah. I can still remember when the fellow in Israel, uh, I was talking with him, we were, I was trying to keep up with him in my Hebrew and wasn't able to do so, but we eventually went back to speaking English and he had a good Brooklyn accent when he did that too, by the way, but, uh, but he was very fluent in Hebrew. And he looked at me and he said, because I had told him that I was a believer, Amin be Yeshua, I'm, I'm a believer in Yeshua. And he looked at me and he said, do you really believe that a virgin got pregnant? Yes, I do. And I, and I told him, that's what circumcision is all about. That Isaac was going to come by a miraculous birth that God himself would perform and we have the same thing going on with the coming of Yeshua, that Yeshua, that Miriam conceived by the Holy Spirit. Well, well, we don't, it doesn't say that that was the case, but nonetheless, he gave the ability for her to conceive, no doubt about that. So, if it was, 
It signaled the coming of the promised one by miraculous birth, and thus when Yeshua arrived, not through the normal means of procreation, but through the mysterious and miraculous virgin birth, circumcision, or some would want to say virginal conception, okay, but whatever, circumcision as the sign of the covenant was fully realized. Indeed, both in our text as well as in the apostolic scriptures, part of which we read for our apostolic portion, the fact that Avram and Sarah both appeared well beyond the age capable of having children illustrates that Isaac was a miracle baby even beyond the fact that every birth is a miracle. For while the birth of Isaac, had it been at the time in their lives when they were younger, would have been accepted as normal or natural, his birth in their old age was understood by all as a direct miracle by God on their behalf. Now, I'm not saying... Abraham went on, on and had more children, right? Keturah. But... Of course, the ritual circumcision took on a different significance in the nation of Israel. And what was that? And this is where we get hung up. Circumcision became a sign of being part of the Jewish nation. And this is why we sometimes get uh, hung up on what Paul is telling us. And I don't know if... Let let me see if I can untangle that a little bit. Um... The significance on, on a, uh, the ritual of circumcision took on a different significance in, an, in the nation of Israel as she wandered farther and farther away from the faith in Hashem in which she was called to walk. Rather than understanding circumcision as a sign of the promised one, circumcision became a self-identity, a sign of Israelite status. Let me just regress a bit and just say, have you ever, how many of you have ever been to a, a what they call a brit milah, or what the Ashkenazi say, bris, bris milah, um, where you've actually attended a rabbinic circumcision. Okay. I've asked some rabbis before and when we've talked at, at different places. I've asked them about this and, and the, the answers they've given me haven't been very satisfying. At every, traditionally, at every circumcision, there's a chair for whom? Elijah. Why? Why is there a chair for Elijah? Because when Elijah comes, there shall be the return of the Messiah. But why does that, what does that have to do with circumcision? Exactly. They say every time a, a male child is born to a Jewish mother, is it possible that this one is the Messiah? So even unknown to them, maybe, they say, this, they say circumcision is tied in with Messiah. It's kind of an interesting way to open a conversation with some <laughs> Jewish person if you're... Uh, if you, if you want to do that at some time, at some point, say, why do we have a chair at, for Elijah at circumcision? Because circumcision says, this child is not going to come by normal means of procreation, not by normal fleshly means, not by the power of the flesh, but by the miracle of God. Let me just read a little further and then I'll take some of your comments or questions. So by the time the first century uh, came, circumcision became the sign of being accepted into the nation of Israel, which is why a proselyte, as far as we can tell, a, Jew, a Gentile person, male, who wanted to have legal status within the Jewish uh, community, had to become circumcised. So if, as I've said, circumcision was in its final analysis a sign of the miraculous birth of Messiah, why would it ever be prohibited to God-fearing non-Jews? Paul says, if you become circumcised, you will have fallen from grace. He's talking to the Gentiles, right? You'll be accursed. What we must understand, however, about Paul's use of the word circumcision is that it is a shorthand way of identifying the rabbinic ritual of proselytizing. That is, the rabbinic ritual of saying, you were a Gentile yesterday, now you're a Jew. Going through a ceremony, a man-made ceremony, that gave a Gentile Jewish status. You can't find that anywhere in the Bible. So, indeed, Paul can use the term circumcision to mean Jews. He says the circumcision... Right, And he's talking about the Jewish people. It seems clear when this is kept in mind that what Paul is teaching against when he is telling the non-Jews not to be circumcised was the widely held notion that only Israelites had a place in the world to come. We have this in the Mishnah. I know it's late, but we have it nonetheless in the Mishnah. Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1, it says, All Israel has a place, have a place in the world to come. Except for, and then it goes and says, except for those who... uh, say that there is no world to come, who would that be? Sadducees, right? Um, 
you know, uh, except for those who read um, uh, Greek philosophy, that is, who study it and become entangled with Greek philosophy, etc., etc. There's many others uh, reasons why you would not be able to have a place in the world to come. But it, what, what I take it to mean, and make this sh short, it simply means this. There was a teaching at the time of Paul, as best we can understand it, that if you had legal Jewish status, that is, you were born a Jew or you went through their ceremony to become a Jew, you were in. That was your salvation. Now, how did you stay in? Because the Torah says you can get cut off from your people for certain things, right? Right. So they were teaching to be part of the people is your salvation. I have talked, let me use another illustration here, I've talked with people who grew up in, in churches where they said, if you were baptized as a baby, if you were sprinkled or baptized as a baby, you're saved. Now, if someone from that kind of a church, sorry if that was any of you, <laughs> but at any rate, if, 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 you, if there were people that say, uh, some persons or a person who came into Behalel, who had grown up in that idea and was now beginning to question it, and the first thing that they ask is, I need you to baptize me. What should we say? Say, we need to talk about what baptism means. We need, you need to wait and we need to make sure that you understand the biblical view of baptism. Now, what do you suppose happened when some of those Gentile people came into groups of the, believing, of the believers, the followers of Yeshua, and they said, please circumcise me. Please, say, wait a minute, why are you doing that? Well, that's what you have to do to get in. That's what you have to do to be part of your group, right? And Paul said, no. If you think, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, if you think circumcision is the, is the, the way that you get right standing before God, you're going to be accursed. You're going to stand before him and say, look, look what I did. Does that remind you of Matthew 7? Many will say in that day, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do wonderful works in your name? And he will say, he will say depart from me, you who are accursed, who, have, who are, have lives of lawlessness. In other words, you never had the real thing. So this is what Paul means in Galatians when he says, if you receive circumcision, that is, if you receive circumcision as a way of being accepted within the family of God, you've missed the mark. But what does circumcision tell us? It's the sign of the, it's not the sign, it is the covenant. Why? Again, if we look at the structure of the Abrahamic covenant, okay? The, the first time it's reiterated is in chapter 12. And I'm just giving you this to keep the whole picture in mind so we don't piecemeal it. He says, um, I will, he says, I will make your name great, or I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, second promise, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse now, when you find those reiterated throughout the book of Genesis, those are reiterated in different order. But the one that's always put last is what? And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So what is the real essence of the Abrahamic covenant? In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In your seed, all those who are blessed, as I say I will bless them, are going to participate in those blessings. And who is the seed of Abraham in Genesis 12. In your seed all the nations shall be blessed. It's in 15, it's in 18, it's in 22, it's in 28. Um, reiterated again. Okay, Who is the seed? Yeshua. Are we sure about that? Read Galatians 3. Okay, what is, Galatians, what is he saying in Galatians? Paul does a nice little... I mean, Paul also believed in the verbal inspiration and plenary inspiration of the Bible. Because he goes to each to an individual word. He says, when it was said to Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, he doesn't say seeds as to plural, he says seed as singular, which is Messiah. 
Uh, good question. Is there such thing as seed and seeds, in, uh, plural, in Hebrew? There's only one, twice, if I remember correctly. Well, when it's referring to offspring, okay? Because it's exactly the same word that's used for what you plant in the ground. Okay. So there's only really, uh, there's, I think there's two times, one for sure I know of, where it's plural. So it's what we call a collective singular, right? Your descendants, we translate it in a plural, but it's, but I think Paul is making the point, why is the word zerah in the Hebrew, the word seed, almost always singular? He said there had to be a reason. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, he says ultimately it focuses down to Yeshua. Now do you understand why I think, and I don't know I've heard anybody else say this, so you, you have to decide if you think it has value or not. I think circumcision was given ultimately to be a sign of Yeshua. I think circumcision is a sign of the virginal conception that God would bring Yeshua in the flesh, but not through the means of normal procreation. And I do think that uh, the, the word Alma in, uh, in, in Isaiah 7, uh, a virgin shall conceive, give, you know, so forth and so on. I think it should be virgin. It certainly is in the Greek. And it... And we have uh, Matthew quoting it, and he uses the Greek word that can only mean someone who, a woman who has never uh, known a man. So, Parthenos. Septuagint translated it Parthenos, which is the word for virgin, which is clearly the word for virgin. That would have been, supposedly, we don't know a lot about the Septuagint, but that would have been... um, at least tradition has it that it was it was Hebrew scholars and something Jewish Hebrew scholars that translated it. 